the primary thing that it took for the development to, that took up also a lot of time is that the OS2 kernel doesn't provide certain type of memory management that the, uh, the WebKit code is expecting that it has on Linux. So basically the libcx code had to be drastically overhauled and a whole bunch of shared memory code that the kernel doesn't provide had to be hoisted in there. And this is pretty advanced stuff. It's, well, it's kind of a secondary. That also has exposed a slight kernel defect, which has been fixed in the latest ArcOS kernel. So that's how far the, that defect was, by the way, always there. It just got exposed by this specific program. Oh, well, well, hey, it's a 30 year old kernel, so. Is he Oh, it's there already. Okay. <coughs> <coughs> uh. Oh. Oh, shoot. It's a Windows USB stick, so you probably can't mount it. You did DFC. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly, you need DFC. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. Uh, uh, that stick is up in my hotel room. Does anybody have another USB stick that works under OS2 that I can hijack? There we go. Uh, We've got a bone here. Oh, uh, uh, too old. <laughs> <laughs> well, now you can upgrade a 17 for free. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> True. <clears throat> well, that isn't what we were going to do. I'm sorry, I just had the uh, Windows machine up and I could as well, but didn't listen to my Windows machine. Oh, I'm copying already. Hang in there. <laughs> oh, okay. Mm -hmm. But something's got to be annoying. Yeah. yeah. It's that bright object in the sky. It's, it, I don't like it. <laughs> Because it's not cloudy out there, so it's bright and sunny, right? Yeah. No? There's a lot of Star Wars over there. Actually, uh, I should be celebrating it actually rained in California. <laughs> uh, trade. Yeah. So there'll be mudslides now? Not from three tenths of an inch, no. <laughs> that we're cheering on three tenths of an inch tells you, tells you something. <laughs> I had, I had three inches the other day, a couple, about a week, two weeks ago. If there are any stupid typos in there, I'm not a naked English speaker, and uh, I, as I said, I wanted to slam this presentation together. This warp stock, since I have three presentations, I wanted to prepare stuff, but Wednesday night before I left, I still had an interview with Dimitri that I'll be doing on Sunday. It was 11 p.m., and then the next day I got out of bed to run to the airport, so anyway. It's in the root drive there. It's... Where is it? Oh, that one. Yes. I'm going to just put it in the right place. That way I'll be able to upload it. There It's that one? Yes. It's a big one. It has some couple of ugly. I've put some ugly yeah, screenshots in it. Sorry for the bad yeah, picture quality, okay, but I cannot put it anything on the external screen. So <coughs> that's why the screenshots are in there. So that otherwise, I need to put a laptop on the table here and point the webcam at it. So it's 15 megabytes, but it seems to be taking a long time. I don't know. Which. <coughs> Is it plugged into a USB 1.1 port? It, it, <laughs> probably. It, it's blinking. <laughs> doing something. Well, this this other USB. Th this is what I meant with copy dialogs being bring that. See, it tells you nothing where it is. It's yeah. just copy. Yeah. It says nothing. And you can't even press a cancel button while it's running. No. It's all no. blocked. It's, it's but you can press the close button. Yeah. <laughs> and it disappears. I don't know when. <laughs> 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 
But in 87, that was the coolest thing. I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, by contrast, Windows Progress Bar went to 99% in the 70s. That's right. <laughs> yeah. And it still does it today. I see it happen all too often. And that tells you 10 minutes remaining, and then five minutes later, 20 minutes remaining. <laughs> Eight days remaining. <laughs> Crank it up. Yes. Who's familiar here with how UEFI 5 roughly works? Yeah, it is. <laughs> you, you don't try, right? <laughs> 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 what is it? It's your mouse, I think. Oh, I, I didn't. Well, you should be able to open your. No, it works. Oh, okay. Well, I didn't. I don't. I didn't. Oh. I disabled the pad. I, I hate that. Yeah, but the mouse is off. See. This is a pointer's right there. No, but it's. Oh, that's how it works. So, how's it? The wrist. The wrist. The, the wrist. The wrist. The pulse. Oh, it's all on the wrist. wrist. It's all on the wrist. Think pinball. Yeah. And now we're. <laughs> yeah, you can keep we're here. Yeah. Or frisbee. Or frisbee. <laughs> <laughs> Where's the full screen sucker? F12, isn't it? Is that F12? Well, yeah, I got pretty good. No, it's not. Isn't it F5? F5, 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 sorry. Or F5? It's a window. F5? I'll take any suggestion. Yeah, there it is. There you go. Okay. Am I sick correct? And how do you switch the slide then? Uh, with it. Take it down, take it down. Put it higher up a little bit. On this. There we go. Okay, before any confusion gets thrown into the room or other people watching the stream, this is a voice project. This is not an Ark Noah product, project. Um, I've when I still was involved at Mensis, I looked at UEFI. In fact, if you look on the UEFI member list, Mensis is still an active UEFI member, but it never came to fruition. So I've been peeking at UEFI for some time. I've been on the testers team for a long time. I've been testing UEFI on too many systems. Uh, it has been on my list. Um, Arcanoa in 5.1 will be distributing signed binaries of UEFI. That's to accommodate the process, but the tools that will be provided by OS2 Voice later on will be made publicly available and support will be available done by Voice. So eventually it will probably get included in ArcOS, but just like other projects, this is a third party project, not developed by Arc Noah, and maybe in the end it might get supported in the future. But this secure boot has been implemented, and I'll get to the reason why we started implementing um, it. I'll show you what UEFI is and how a cert gets installed, because it's kind of tricky. I'll just move along. Well, the first thing that I want to explain, just to get back to the basis, is that, to put it bluntly, OS2 is just like Windows and Linux is a protected mode operating system and it has its own device drivers that talk to the hardware. IBM One S506, Dan S506, USB drivers, Panorama, etc. There are, however, a couple of issues where OS2, for a short portion of its startup, and when it's running, it depends on the so-called BIOS services. Mm. So this basically, and some people might shoot me for this description, but this is just to simplify it extremely. Take, for example, your old WordPerfect 5.1. You would click switch on your AT286, do, 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 start starting up, and then it loads, you've got a C prompt, and you type WP for WordPerfect and hit enter. What happens in the background is that those systems did not have a device driver. This DOS is also called disk operating system. What actually happens in the background is that the real older versions of DOS, they accessed the hard disk via in 13 So basically DOS says to the BIOS, give me this sector from the hard drive, and then DOS would process it and send it up the food chain to WordPerfect. 
That's how floppy disks got started, etc. The BIOS knew how to operate. Later, you got your first Visa local bus card or PCI card, and you could install a DOS driver that would accelerate driver access. Remember Windows 3.11 with 32-bit disk access? Wow. Also, on the video side, you've got a service that's buried in the video server called Int10, and that's one of the interfaces, for example, that's used for, uh, for uh, querying the screen size, what resolution it runs at, and I think it's also used for DPMS. Now, later on, you'll start to understand where UEFI is different compared to uh, a standard MBR boot. This is a drastic oversimplification, but basically what happens on the system, you turn it on, it starts to boot, the MBR gets written by the BIOS, and then it loads OS2 loader, OS2 boot, and the kernel. The order might be different. You mean it gets red? The MBR gets red. 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 Uh, yes, gets red. And, it, and in the MBR, there's a jump instruction to read from a partition the OS2 loader and then these other files. And from there on, the system uses int13 partially during the boot to load its base dev. So that's that's the USB host controller driver, the storage OS2 DASD. Now, fast forwarding to UEFI, I kind of nicked this from, copied this from Alex, but it, it's gonna, a lot of systems that you can now buy off the shelf the CSM is gone. Intel already said in January 2020 we're going to phase it out, so you can still get some main boards, but it's 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 running at the end of its life. So um, this this list here is a very raw generalization, but this is what I basically said: is that there are two main pillars where OS2 leans on the BIOS, and this is where the UEFI dependency has to come in. First of all. As I said, getting the kernel to start, it uses int 13 in the background to talk to the hard drive before it has loaded its drivers so that it can boot. On UEFI, int 13 kind of exists. UEFI has disk services that it provides to the operating system. But, there's a but. Every OS calls a so-called service in the UEFI from the UEFI loader called exit from boot services. And it's up to the implementer of the operating system to determine when that call should be made. The moment that that call is made, it's the point of no return. Because at that moment, all of the USB keyboard support, uh, disk support to read the disk or USB or CD-ROM drive, etc., gets unloaded from memory. There the operating system has to stand on its own two legs and go from there. This is the reason that Windows, for example, and Linux distributions load all of the files necessary via UEFI services on a RAM disk in the background, mm -hmm. and then when it's done, flick the switch. And from that moment on, and then the operating system in turn starts to load from that RAM disk. That's what's done under the bonnet by the UEFI loader. So in 13, is, has calls have been rerouted, and that OS2 boot file now talks to this RAM disk to load the files. The intense stuff is also gone. So with the advent of, of, of UEFI, the whole thing that you know, Hercules, CGA, EGA, VGA, Super VGA, all of that stuff was still part of your VGA card. You could run Cat from IBM, the 1984 game with the cat going to left to right on the fence. You could still load that. All of that stuff out the window because now something is used called UEFI GOP. So the changes are pretty radical in that sense. And that is exactly where OS2 was leaning on. Moving forward, click. Basically what we have right now is we can boot Arc OS on hardware. It supports high resolution. We saw it on mm -hmm. Alex's laptop runs at 2500. Memory dump support. A lot of users will probably or hopefully never need it. But once an OS2 system runs into trouble, the so-called memory dump facility is something that enables 
uh, you to write a dump of the memory to the hard drive. In the background, there's a small program in the root directory of your drive called OS2Dump. OS2Dump is a mini bit of real code that runs in real mode just like DOS. And it talks to the disk controller and dumps the whole content of the memory to the hard drive, to a specified drive that has the label SA dump. But that thing was only designed to talk to in 13. But that's gone. Mm. So this one has now a workaround that you can dump to a uh, RAM disk or an AHCI controller. That's another workaround. So that's working. Hopefully you'll never need it, but for remote diagnostics, in some cases, it could be necessary to create a dump. Windows 2 support was working already, and the DOS support is also working. You might say, DOS, why is that so interesting? The problem is, all of these old DOS games all are expecting all sorts of old quirks. CGA, EGA, Hercules. Uh, if you're on the testers list, you can see what a flurry of applications have been tested. And it's a huge list. You can run WordPerfect 6.0 basically on an i9 system, full screen in 1280 times 1024, and it's working. But the whole video card that's used in DOS <coughs> is emulated in a new driver called VEFI.sys, and everything, because the whole dependency on the VD VGA BIOS is gone. Yeah, a lot of stuff just was sucked down the toilet. Um, so, there's now a new boot menu, because that also had to be thrown out the window. The boot manager and Airboot no longer work, because they depend on the BIOS. And uh, the INT10 output, if you use Airboot, it, sends, it talks to INT10 for some of its video output. So you kind of can get a feel for it that everything that has to do with the startup code that we were used to, it's no longer there. It's wishful thinking it could, but that's the advent of Stephen. So, uh, da, da, da. there's another base DLL called BS, uh, BVH VGA. You've probably seen it referenced somewhere in the crevices of your configs. And that one is one of the base DLLs that gets loaded very early on for the video handling. Won't work, it's dependent on the VGA BIOS. Bye bye. <laughs> Another one had to go. So that has been replaced with BVH VGA DLL. To give you a short impression, the only thing, if I summarize this correctly, is that the current video support that you have on the UEFI system is only a memory address that you can write data to. All of the other fancy bits have been stripped out. That's it. People that have been wanting to run uh, people that are looking for functions like keys to change the volume or the screen brightness or change the output port, that used to be done by the BIOS. But the whole thing with UEFI is to strip everything out to the bare minimum and only make it basically an OS loader. UEFI still provides some services to the operating system, but the general trend is to scrap it all. Mm -hmm. and that's what you're noticing on all of these laptops. I wanted to do my presentation here with my HP laptop hooked up to the Beamer, <laughs> but I can't switch it to the external port. So, hmm. well, I already said this. This is basically working. Mm -hmm. If you want to see it, you can either see Alex's laptop or my laptop there in the back. Everything's working. Panorama, Windows 2, DOS, everything works the way that you're used to it. The real difference where you notice it on installing it is the boot looks slightly different, the Alt F1 menu has been altered, any mini LVM when you install to a GPT disk. But other than that, as a user, you will not really notice the difference. Because once it's past the boot stage, it loads the drivers, it comes into the workplace shell, and you've got a mouse, you can start DOS and Windows too, and it all works. So oh. I already described that. One of the benefits that you could do now is that you can also create dumps bigger for more than two gigs of RAM. It's not recommended, but if you have an oddball malfunction, you can at least still capture a dump. That, that was not possible in the past, but now with the integrated dump, it can 
uh, automatically create dumps bigger than two gig. But I know Arc Nova doesn't want memory dumps bigger than 512 megabytes, so if you can squeeze the size, that's always beneficial. No NVMe that. Sorry? Was to dump is not NVMe? No, no, it's not. No, no. Mm -hmm. And this is already as far as they could push it. Yeah. Um, I already said this about, about all the legacy stuff. I know there are still people that want to use it. You see that popping up in forums, hey, I want to have the DOS window to work. So if you now want a DOS window to work or seamless Windows 2, this is guaranteed to work because it's no longer dependent on the video hardware. It does it in software. And that way you can just open it off. I think Lewis lost that for accounting stuff because now you can copy paste again from a DOS window to a spreadsheet and back and forth. Well, I'm, I'm using machines that still actually do support DOS, but what's kept me on those machines is that I haven't been able to do that on a new machine. Now I can do that on a new machine. Uh, uh, that one? The other things that are now working is uh, the Altafone recover recovery menu, because that also works differently. You see, when OS2 starts to load, those boot services that we're talking about, they're gone. So now the UEFI bootloader, before the boot services are gone, deals with the Alt F1 menu. You'll get a different menu, but basically with the same functionality. But you have no choice. Windows does this as well in some cases that the recovery choices will have to be made when you're in the UEFI loader and not because the operating system, because once the operating system has started, you can't press <coughs> a button anymore. With Windows 7 on an MBR boot and Windows loading already, you could go into a recovery menu and press a button. But that was because the BIOS was still in the background providing these services. So it's consistent that those keys just fly out the window when it loads. Uh, and there's GPT disk support, which is a big step forward. It has some downsides, but at least you can now just take and install Windows, resize the disk. You've seen that happen. You can now more or less transparently install Arc OS next to it, as Neil has been testing. And you can just keep Windows installed. Yes? You're, uh, if I interpret that, you're saying that I should look forward to being able to dual boot off of the G, uh, GPT disk, both uh, Windows and Arc OS. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And, and it back, you go back and forth with yes. ease. Okay, excellent. In fact, I think the process has never been that trans that simple because when you install it, it automatically adds the existing Windows installation to the little boot manager that we have for the UEFI systems. You get an entry, something called Windows 10 or old, you find <coughs> it, and then you can just switch between Arca OS and Windows just like that. Just as, a, as they enter. Okay. Yes, it does the installation automatically and it picks up the old loader. That's it. Does yeah, it recognize that. Linux partitions also? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And BOS and. <laughs> well. Okay, I thought I just wanted to give you a crash course UEFI, where basically the big things are because secure boot is one of the things. Now we've heard doom and gloom scenarios going around that secure boot would lock up the systems. We all have got a kind of a Microsoft, anti-Microsoft attitude, which is kind of healthy, but it's also not every time true. The intent behind secure boot is actually understandable. Um, basically, when you go with your, web, with your web browser to a website, your browser has a, has a certificate built in from an SSL provider that is deemed trusted. Mm -hmm. When you visit a website that has an SSL certificate, for example, from uh, Let's Encrypt, from the Freedom uh, on the FEE organization, the browser will recognize that as a trusted thing. So how does that work with Secure Boot? Well, I'm going to extremely simplify it again, but it's basically the same. If you have an AV loader, and this is where it's different. There is something that you have to get used to. It's called the so-called ESP partition, which stands for... Um, Extended uh, System Partition. Thank you. You can dream of it. Basically, if you look at a disk that has a GPT layout, it has 
the MBR is still there at the front, but it's just a dummy, it does nothing. Mm -hmm. Then there's a ESP partition, which I, uh, sorry, there's one megabyte of space allocated for the partition table, which is a lot, but you can stick about 128 partitions, I think, max on a GPT disk. Also, uh, there is a ESP partition, and the difference bet between an MBR sector is that UEFI firmware looks on its ESP partition to find the so-called AV loader. <coughs> and that is actually the binary that gets loaded by the firmware to jumpstart the OS loading. That's basically the equivalent of what you could call OS2 boot and the OS2 loader. That's kind of its <coughs> equivalent. Now, what Microsoft has done is that it has signed, it has started to sign SS, it has started to sign these AV binaries. Why? The way that is implemented on Windows is that a large portion of the boot chain is now secured by a signature. Effectively, if one of the core Windows device drivers gets compromised by a virus and you reboot, the firmware will hold and it will give you a message that the system is compromised. That's how far secure boot goes. But where do we fit in? Well, let me just go one slide further. I've been testing ArcOS on different hardware, everything I can get my hands on that gets stick and gets booted. But I also want to install. So I've got one Linux box at home that my boyfriend uses, and it has Linux on it, but it has secure boot switched on. So every time I switched off secure boot, well, he wants to have it switched on, so I start wondering, well, it's not good. The other thing is, I've been reading up on the internet that with the advent of Windows 11, there are some signs that certain things might not work correctly if secure boot is switched off. It will probably work, but you want to have convenience. So thanks to Jeroen and Steve again, we've been working over the last couple of months on this project. It will eventually be made open source on the still yet to set up GitHub repository, and it's based on Linux tools that have been adopted to work on OS2. Um, and one other thing, there are people speculating that secure boot switching it off that that possibility will go away. I strongly disagree, and I'll tell you why. If you want to do device driver development on Linux, Windows, or anything else, you need to be able to turn off Secure Boot for development purposes. So, I'm sorry to have to say this, there are some of these low-end Google Chromebooks and the Microsoft Surface tablet that are locked down, but I, from my current information, I think it's it's scaremongering to say that secure boot is going to be disappearing because you need to be able to turn it off as a developer. So if you want to compile your own Linux kernel or you want to compile the device driver on Windows that's not signed, you need to have that exit. There are also certain AV drivers in the corporate environment that are not signed by Microsoft. So you've got, and that's actually an exit for us. You see, how can we convince the UEFI firmware to accept our signed UEFI binaries? Well, that's possible. Um, in some systems, it can be done in the UEFI firmware itself. You can go there, and there's key management in there. And on the new Arca OS stick, you will find a DB file, which is the actual SSL cert with which the AV binaries have been signed. And you can import that into the UEFI menu even without turning secure boot off. That means that on the next reboot, UEFI firmware will scan the uh, AV file of Arca OS and since the, since the certificate has been imported into the UEFI firmware, it will get the green light and load it. Now, sorry about this crappy screenshot that I just took from Alex's laptop, but there are other systems where there is no certificate management present. So then the question comes, well, how the hell do I then do it? Well, 
what you can see here is that there is an option called reset the setup mode. Basically, the UEFI firmware has a lock, a padlock, on the importing of a certificate via the UEFI interface. That API, that call, is blocked. Now, here's the first public screenshot of the... Oh, sorry. No, I forgot. Uh, this is basically the procedure that we have. What we now have is that in most UEFI firmwares, there's an option, just like the HP laptop I have in the back, to back up the current keys, in which you have the key from the, the manufacturer of the laptop and the Windows UEFI key, you back them up. You reset all keys <coughs> and wipe them out. Remember, these are stored on disk. Now, if anything goes wrong, there's always an option reset certs, so you can always go back to the original setting. Then the UEFI firmware gets switched to what's called user mode. That opens up the door and accepts the firmware to import the backed up keys plus the Arc Noah cert. And then the UEFI firmware on the next reboot will recognize the UEFI loader. So you can basically import a uh, an, an, an SSL disk cert from Arca OS with some tools that do that. And then you can re-enable Secure Boot and then it works. And I you retain that Windows one as well? Yes, because what happens is here you can see basically what it says. This is a, a screenshot of the VIO tool that we have. Step one, backs up your Secure Boot keys and prepares to install. As you enable the setup mode in your system, for the secure boot settings. Install Arca OS secure boot key and restoring the original settings. It sucks all the files in phase one out of UEFI firmware, stores them on disk, and then it reboots. Here you can see a, a crappy screenshot of my HP firmware, but I can then select clear all boot keys. And with that moment that I press that button, the keys are wiped from memory, the system reboots, and then the, the lock goes off the door. Then I go booting back into Arc OS, and I get to step two. Here, it will glue the AN cert to the backup certificates, and then it will reinsert that into the firmware. Hmm. Oh, one too far. And then eventually you can see here, secure boot is in setup mode. We'll install Arca OS secure boot certificate and restore your original secure boot settings. And you see here, restoring the keys. And then you can go, and on the reboot, you can go back into the firmware and secure boot is enabled. So with the advent of Arca OS 5.1, we get GPT support. We get plus two terabyte disk support. We get UEFI disk support, and with this, we get a high degree of UEFI of secure boot support. One warning, this will not work on all laptops. It doesn't say on the box that this method will work. I've got one crappy Toshiba laptop at home, and it doesn't have this. It can only load the Windows certificate. But that's uh, a 10 year old box. And most of these laptops that we have today have got that. Remember, I showed you this screen, this weird screenshot. Where is it? Yes. This one. It's, it's so cryptic. The first time I was looking at it, I went, huh? What is that? But this basically, you, you, when, you clear the key, you, when you clear the keys, there's also here load HP default factory keys. So if it gets screwed up, you can always revert back and keep secure boot switched on. Mm -hmm. After all of these years having worked on OS2, I think we've never come that close to the best of our abilities as a community to pick up that far with hardware. Uh, and I think it's a pretty big milestone that we've got all of this stuff on the table. So I hope this wasn't hasn't fried your brain, but this <laughs> this this kind of gives you a rough insight what things you can look forward to when ArcOS 5.1 comes out. So just to reiterate, 
this is a voice project. And this was done to facilitate development. And I'd like to thank Steve and my boyfriend Jeroen for diving into it. This is 99% based on Linux code, made with some code changes to talk to our UEFI loader, because it needs to be able to do that. And I think that with the advent of 5.1, we'll be breaking the ice. We're working on the browser to the best of our abilities, play catch up on that. So are there any questions on this topic? Or have I saturated you when you say, well, want to bark with you? So does UEFI provide all those support services that BioFuser provide? Or how, what happens? No, it's completely different. Yeah. A portion, there is actually something in the, in the specs called UEFI services. Uh -huh. But some of those services are only available at boot time. So basically, the boot up phase of the of UEFI of loading an operating system consists of two phases. It's the UEFI loader from the operating system vendor that gets loaded, that does some stuff in the background, and then when the operating system is ready to start on its own legs, it tells to the firmware exit from boot services. And then primarily what you see is that support for storage, USB control like your mouse and keyboard, that gets unloaded and then the OS needs to deal with it. One of the things that does stay resident is the UEFI services, so where those certs are imported with. The other thing that you will see is when you install ArcOS, I was just telling you it will automatically recognize your Windows boot manager or your AV loader and add that to the AN launcher. But inside the memory of the PC, there's a spot where the boot list is kept for those which AV loader it has to load first. That also gets updated in the background via these UEFI services. It's basically a bit of RAM that stays stored when the system gets switched off and in there is a whole bunch of variables that store settings and files, just like these certs. So uh, this was a crash course UEFI. Remember crash course? Do you have a question? Yeah, I do. Um, so those, those, those uh, certificates, to, uh, they're, they're signing something on the disk. What is it exactly on the disk? Is it, 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 it it's sign? inside the AV binary itself, where a, a, a portion is glued to the executable, to the AV binary itself, that, and the UEFI firmware reads this out. Right, but you said this is for security, so that uh, there's like a, a bogus driver that gets replaced or something. So how, how, does, how does that process know which files to verify? Uh, that's up to the UEFI loader. And the UEFI loader of OS2 is, to put it disrespectful, a dummified version of what Windows or Linux do. We don't, we don't check the kernel. There is no checking on that. This is really the most rudimentary support that you can get. On Windows, they've implemented the support where the whole boot chain gets protected. But implementing that on OS2, my gut feel is that that's mission impossible. <coughs> so that's why the, the checking of device drivers isn't done. So it's just a specification that says this, this particular block? Or is it uh, uh, yes. And we've, I, we've ported Linux tools to sign those AV binaries. You can actually find them online that if you've compiled your own AV binaries, that you can sign them yourself and import your own search. And those tools will also be released. I don't think anybody has any need for them. But all of this code will be released under the GPL license in the coming months. And then we will, as voice, expand the test audience on more equipment. But as I said, this secure boot stuff is a best effort basis. It might not work on your system, but based upon just snooping around and looking in different BIOSes, I think that every modern laptop will have this reset capability of, real, of ditching the firmware. The primary reason to really implement it is that I've got a Windows 11 laptop at home, and if you turn off secure boot, and you have the BitLocker encryption switched on, it will keep asking for your recovery key. The BitLocker encryption is something that's built into Windows so that you can encrypt your hard drive. And that was one of the things where I went like, hmm, could we make this easier? So, 
And the other thing is I've been looking for years in how an AV binary could be signed by Microsoft. But the requirements, if you look at it at a glance, look very simple. But then you start reading the fine print and it's unclear if they would ever sign an OS2 UEFI loader. So this was the next best thing. This took about two months to implement. So. If I'm writing a, a Windows virus, what, why can't I write that nice faux driver and then certify it and have it loaded by the laptop security? Ah, program? that's very simple. Because as a, uh, as a vendor, you will need to be certified with Microsoft mm -hmm. and all of your data, including the color of your underwear and what toothpaste you use. Okay, just kidding. But Microsoft will know that it's you and you will be signing that device driver with your cert and they will ask them for your passport, whatever, mm -hmm. and company data to verify that it's you. So if you write the device driver, because actually that device driver will be certified and reviewed and signed by Microsoft. So the moment that find out that uh, you have created a virus dr a driver that has been signed with a virus in it and it's <coughs> done intentionally, they'll cancel your certificate. And the next time you try to install a Windows, it will say, <coughs> All right, so our mm -hmm. certificate is registered with Microsoft. No, it's no. not. Because well, it's a self-created certificate. But why, why can't the virus? Virus writer do that. Ah. The virus would be running under Windows, right? No, yes. because oh. the one that is installing the virus will have to go to the bi to the oh, BIOS, okay. say clear all the keys, put my key there, and then, oh. and then the load the computer. That, uh, I'll just so go I back. Because you can't. For uh, the moment, through the internet, you cannot uh, do that on the virus. Look, it's, it on was the, this on the screenshot, screenshot, this one here, Th this BIOS screenshot. You need to go into the BIOS yourself and press a button to clear the keys so that you can actually install them. So it's not oh, possible for, for a virus. Yeah. So like Roderick said, at, at this moment you're opening the door yeah. it's not about for installing our OS yeah. or installing a virus, but yeah. the user... Uh, now to make fun of it, secure book was mocked at one time because it turned out that Microsoft had accidentally in the developer toolkit released the root certificate of secure boot. Oh. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, you wonder how they could have effed that out. I mean, it's the, but they revoked that certificate and a new UEFI firmware stated. Will our cert all be, will ever be blacklisted? I doubt it because uh, this, is the, this is the freedom that you have as a, as a user to import your own cert. And I know that in big corporate environments, they also have their own UEFI key management. That's why some of these corporate laptops have got this whole system built in. And some of these modern imaging tools have got it as well. I'll cut a long story short. This is what we're doing to get secure boot on OS2. And uh, yeah, I know it's a <coughs> long ride to see ArcOS 5.1 hit the finish line, but I think it's awfully close and the amount of stuff that is in there. Are there any questions there? Yeah, no, no, my, my question. On, on, which, le, on which computer brands have you tested the experimental secure boot support? So far on three different systems. Uh, an MSI mainboard, uh, a Toshiba, and my HP laptop there. But I've already been talking to Andy Willis, and he has a couple of ThinkPads. And Alex, that screenshot that you had seen here, Go back. Where is it? The battery empty? I'll just. <coughs> mm, it's frozen. Oh, I think it just hung itself. Or oh. Oh. It's a page up page down. Yeah, I'm doing that. No, no, it's, it's, it's a cord. Just press the button. This screenshot is from Alex's laptop, and this is that user mode that I was referring to. And I wouldn't see why it wouldn't work. This is a standardized interface, part of the UEFI specs. So unless they did something really stupid, this should work on most of the laptops. Most of the laptops that I've been able to get my hands on have got this user mode somehow. So I'm expecting this to work on most of the systems. So if you hit that key when you start up, you should see something that will get you to this place? 
Yes, this is what I refer to as the UEFI setup, is basically the old BIOS that you enter in. But what you will see if you have a laptop with a UEFI firmware, you'll see the trend that I mean. Everything's being stripped out, everything. So your former key to switch the beamer or set an external screen or change the screen brightness, gone. But there will be some, and you saw there are only two line items there for the key management. And are, there, are there any other questions? No? Okay, so thank you for your time, and I hope you found this a bit informative, what's being worked on by voice. We're working on some more projects. I did just, <coughs> I just had a quick uh, email exchange with Dmitry Steklanov from Russia. He's mm. okay, mm. and I'm hoping that he will soon be able to release a new Object Rex version for OS2 that has been compiled. I know Steve has been testing it, and from his perspective, it's almost production ready. That would give us Object Rex 5.0 on OS2 for any Rex enthusiasts in the room. So, okay, thank you for your time. And, uh, <laughs>
That's my recollection. Yes. Yeah. We're not experts at it. We, I mean, as I said, 99% of this code is copy-pasted from <coughs> Linux and has just been altered. The two tools to sign the AV binaries on OS2 are just a straight port done with GCC, nothing else, recompile, click. It's not, that's the benefit that we have GCC on OS2 and all of these other tool chains. If we wouldn't have had them, <coughs> we would have been toast long ago. So, are there any other questions? Go on once. Good job, thank you. Go on twice. Okay, thank you again. Then. Very good. <coughs> thank you. If anybody wants to see it here, this laptop's running with secure boot, but that's, that's basically. Or do you want to meet at the restaurant? We can meet at the restaurant. It's not that far. You can walk over there. It, Cecil's is a, it's a little a little ways away. Are we it's going just across the highway and down a little ways, right? That one? No, that's Sunny's. That's Sunny's. Oh, that's a different oh, okay. I mean, we could go to Sunny's instead. I mean, I'm not. No, no. Once, once we can go to any of them.